guys are here today. I just want to let y'all know they're getting bags of candy, so when they come out, they're going to be really excited. <laughs> All right? Um, here's your next homework assignment. Um, during the message, I want you to be listening for the words in between the words. And if you do social media, I want you to consider tweeting or, or uh, Instagramming something that the Lord lays on your heart during this message um, that you identify with or that stepped on your toes. Um, I have found, um, does everybody know you don't get something the first time you hear it anyway? Has anybody noticed that you don't get something the first time you hear it? And when you, and let's be honest, most of you are playing on your phones anyway. Go ahead and make good use of it. And document something you learn from today's sermon to help it stick better in your soul. Because all of us have trouble with the grudge. The grudge. All of us have trouble with the grudge. Um, we've been talking about, and we're going to talk about for a few weeks. Um, because we're, So we're going to talk about the grudge for a few weeks. And then the four or five weeks leading up to Easter, y'all, Easter's coming up. Did you know that Easter's coming? Um, and it's not as far away as you think it is. We're going to have invite cards for you to invite people to the egg hunt. We're going to do two different egg hunts. We're going to do an egg hunt on the Wednesday night before Easter like we normally do. And then we're going to try something. Is it okay if we try something? Okay. We're going to try something. It, 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 my, my, you know, my daddy and my granddaddy said, do something even if it's wrong. Try. Try something. Um, there are some people who are not going to come on Wednesday night. They're just not. So we're going to do an Easter egg hunt during from probably 11.45 to 12 o'clock on Easter Sunday morning. Yes, I'm going to cut the sermon short to have an egg hunt. Because mamas and daddies like to get their children in some pretty go to meeting rags on Easter Sunday morning. And maybe they'll come to church if they know there's an egg hunt. Well, Ken, you shouldn't have to buy them to come. Listen, I'll pay any price to keep anybody from going to hell. If it gets them in the church. If, if it gets them in the church. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. What's the cost benefit of spending a couple hundred dollars on candy if, if, a, if a family comes and their life is radically changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ? Yeah, so we're going to try it. We're going to try an egg hunt on Sunday morning. Ken, it ain't going to work. Okay, well, we'll know after we try it, right? So we, we're going to try that. Um, on Wednesday nights, um, I'm wrapping up a sermon subject on keeping the stirring alive. Um, after that, I'm going to speak just a, just a couple weeks on the wisdom of friendship, what the Bible says in the book of Proverbs about friendship. And then I'm working on a big, fat, hairy sermon series on Wednesday nights. If you're not coming on Wednesday nights, you're, you're missing something. Well, Ken, I'll work to the last minute. Well, a lot of people... Get here if you can. We have the free meal at 6.30, 7.15, well, close to it. The people who help clean up, or help, we don't stop, start the study until the kitchen's finished cleaning because I'm not going to teach, and they're in there working. So if you've ever wondered why is it 7.18 and Ken ain't speaking yet, it's because there's people still in the kitchen working. Wow, it's mighty quiet in here. So when, when, when the people who help finish cleaning up finish, we get it there. But from 7.15, 7.20 to 8 o'clock, it's... It, 7.30 to, excuse me, 6.30 to 8 o'clock, we have the meal, and then we have, and I'm, I'm, I'm working on a series right now called Contagious Christianity. Contagious Christianity. Because n never in your life have you learned more about contagions than you have in the last two years, have you? And there are fewer people who know the, more people think they know more about contamination than they do. But we're going to talk about what the Bible says about being contagious. All of us are worried about other people being contagious. The most important thing to be contagious about is your Christianity. So if you can make it, if you can make it, if you can make it, 6.30 on Wednesday nights. And even if you can't make it, you can bring a jug of tea on Wednesday, Sundays for us to drink on Wednesday. Did you see I slipped that in there real, real, real smooth like that? Yeah. Um, so we're going to continue talking about the grudge this week. This is going to be one of the weeks we talk about the grudge. And remember, be listening for something that the Spirit may be saying to you that you can document, you can tweet, you can post on social media. So let's start first with a definition. Let's start with a definition of what a grudge is. A grudge is a feeling of deep-seated resentment or ill will, the desire to see another experience pain, injury, or distress. It's synonymous with the word malice, malevolence, ill will and spite now why did I bring that up is because Jesus speaks a lot about our feelings not everyone else's feelings have you ever thought about that Jesus spends a lot of time talking about your feelings not everyone else's feelings 
Because your feelings will drive your belief system. You may, you may prove it to you. You may prove it to you. I know I'm supposed to eat a salad today. I just don't feel like it. I don't want to go to work today. I don't feel like it. I don't want to do so. I don't, I don't feel in love anymore with my spouse. I don't feel this way anymore. Your feelings will lie to you. Did you know that? Your feelings will lie to you. That's why it's important to be in, in touch with what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. And we're going to talk about your feelings, and we're going to talk about specifically a grudge. Jesus talks about it in Matthew chapter 6, and this verse of Scripture many of you are familiar with. Pray in this way. Jesus tells you to pray in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive other people for their offenses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive other people, then your Father will not forgive your offenses. Stop. Go back for me. But if you do not forgive other people, then your Father will not forgive your offenses. There's too many of us walking around with grudges and unforgiveness in our heart. And we wonder why our lives are spiritually stunted or you're going to be really, I'm glad I don't have to make the decision. But at some point, you're going to wake up dead and find out that God has not forgiven you because the Bible says right there, if you do not forgive other people, your father will not forgive you. This is heavy stuff. But it's right there in the B-I-B-L-E. We spend way too much time not forgiving like we're supposed to. And I talked about this last, last time uh, a couple of weeks ago, Song of Solomon. Uh, and, and then I'm going to move on some more to some more commentary. Song of Solomon says in Song of Solomon 2, Catch the foxes for us, the little fox that ruined the vineyard while our vineyards are in blossom. Some of you are more familiar with the phrase, um, the small fox spoils the vine. And a fox might not seem, I'm not, I'm not going to teach again about the fox because it's, it's on YouTube from the sermon I preached a couple of weeks ago. But while a fox may seem like not much of a threat, a fox will dig small holes and create dens in and around the base of the vine and destroy a vine as they rip off large sections of it when they're eating the grapes. I brought up the small fox because the small things in your life will burrow and slowly destroy you from the inside out. The small fox spoils the vine. Rarely, I mean, we, we all get upset and mad about the big things, right? I mean, every, everybody knows that. But, but am I the only one? I think I've talked about this on Wednesday night. Am I the only one that you don't know where the line is, but all of a sudden something small will happen and you just lose it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, not just me. Not just me. And, and what's really funny and sad about it, and I'm not going to camp here, is I'll get mad over, can I say that I'm going to spell it? When I get mad over something, S-T-U-P-I-D, okay, everybody with me? Everybody with what the words? I get angry over something, and then I, Ugh, I'm done. Miss Winnie gets angry because I got angry. Now I'm angry that she's angry at me. <laughs> because I was fine until she got mad because I got mad, right? The small fox will spoil the vine. The small fox will rob you of what God wants to do in your life and even turn into blatant sin between you and God when he clearly says if you do not forgive others, you will not be forgiven. And whether you want to, whether you want to talk about it or not, when you refuse to forgive as a Christian, you're talking about going to hell. Are you listening to me? We're talking about going to hell. You understand hell is real and hell is hot and you don't hear about it a lot on, on TBN or whatever the channel's called now. You don't hear about it a lot from sermons. You don't hear a lot about it in teaching and preaching. But hell is real and hell is hot and there are people that are dying and going to hell right now. And what's scary and terrifying and sad is the Bible says if you refuse to forgive, your Father will not forgive you. And what is the basis of your salvation? Everybody say forgiveness. I'm talking about hell. I ain't talking about heaven. I'm talking about hell. I'm talking about a place. I, somebody remind me. I need to preach on hell. A place, a place where it's eternal darkness. Where you, and quit getting your theology from Netflix. 
Hell is nothing like it's shown in, in whatever your favorite religious thing. What is the name of that show? Okay, Lucifer's a good one. Um, what? The Good Place. Um, that, that, that other show about those two brothers. Um, supernatural. It's nothing like it's supernatural. Salt ain't going to save you from a demon. Don't, don't, <laughs> I'm going to draw salt around my... That, poppycock. Poppycock. Quit getting your theology from Netflix and TV shows. Hell is real. Hell is hot. And there is no bargaining in hell. Oh, at least I'll be hanging out with my buddies. No, it's going to be hell. Do you understand? In hell, you are eternally damned and burning, but you never burn up. The Bible says it's a place that the, the worm dies not. The Greek word for worm there is maggot. So the maggots are constantly eating you. You're constantly being tortured. You're constantly burning. And the, the worst part about hell is the Spirit of God is not there. The Spirit of God is not there. You may think, and you may even say to yourself, I feel like I'm going through hell. Honey, you're not going through anything compared to what eternity is like. Don't ever be tempted to say, man, it is hot as hell. No, it is not. No matter how hot it is, if, it, if it's, that's the coldest place you'll ever spend eternity is when you say it's as hot as hell today. And many of you have worked in tobacco. You've, done, you've worked a whole lot harder than I ever have, and you know what hot is. But it's nothing compared to hell. I'm talking about hell. Are you listening to me when I say hell? And unforgiveness will drive you to hell. A one-way ticket there. Small things add up if you don't deal with them. That is true in your regular life, and that's true in your spiritual life. The small fox will spoil the vine. Now, let me say for the record, please completely hear me from start to finish here. I am not saying some of you have no right to be upset. No one should ever look at someone else and say, you don't have the right to feel that way. That doesn't even make sense. How I feel has nothing to do with whether or not you think I should feel that way or not. I feel that way. And sometimes I realize I know I'm not even supposed to feel that way. But the way I feel is the way I feel. Don't tell me. So I'm not saying you shouldn't feel that way. But I have found in my short life that the things that we get the most offended about are the things that w are the places that we have been most violated in life. The things we get most offended about are the places in life that we've been the most violated. Let me give you an example. I give this during Financial Peace University. Maybe, no, I'm sorry. I think Dave Ramsey gives this example. Anyway, I'm going to give it to you. I don't know who came up with it. Um, John and Mary get married right out of high school. They're in love. John turns out to be the guy she didn't think he was. And John gets credit cards, as many credit cards as he can in his name and in her name. And in the name of their newborn, and after he runs up and maxes out every credit card he can, spending money on uh, liquor and wild women and doing all the stuff he wants to do, he skips town and leaves Mary at 19 with $100,000 in debt and a new baby. Mary decides, I'm done with men. Mary finds herself a good Bible-believing church. She gets herself plugged in, and in a few years, she meets Adam. And Adam is a great man of God. And one thing leads to the other, and they wind up married. And Mary has worked her way out of, in just a few years, working herself to death. She literally has zero debt left and starting from scratch. They're married, and a year goes by. And one day, Adam needs gas, and he left his pocketbook, his, 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 his cash at home. So he signs up for one of them quick credit card things at the gas station and swipes it and gets gas, and he doesn't think a thing about it. The bill comes in the mail in a couple of weeks. Adam walks in the house, and Mary goes through the roof. Now, Adam thinks it's $27. Well, no, no not anymore. It's $107 in gas. <laughs> Why are you so mad about one credit card bill? I'm, we're going to pay it. We have the money. Mary has been violated so badly in finances 
that even though she knows Adam is not that man, the violation is so strong she can't help but act out because of, of what happened to her. Now, translate that into your everyday life. The places that you have been violated the most are the places you get the most easily offended about. Think about it. The most difficult person to speak into their life is yourself. Because I got advice for all of y'all. I watch you. That's my job. I I, I know of you. I watch you. And if you were to hem me up and say, Ken, tell me something about myself I need to know. First of all, I ain't going to tell you because you're going to lie to me. You're going to say, just tell me. I won't be mad. That's a lie. Church people lie. Ken, no, really, tell me. I want to know. Yeah, uh uh-huh, yeah, mm mm-hmm, yeah. Helen Keller can see that ain't going to happen, right? You're going to lie because you don't want to know. You don't want to know. But for, for me to talk to myself and say, look in the mirror and say, What is the Holy Spirit saying to me? It's the difference, right? I'm not saying you can't be offended or you shouldn't be offended. I'm just here to tell you as your pastor and what the Bible says, Christians, what you're supposed to do with even the smallest offenses in your life. Proverbs 19.11. If you don't read the book of Proverbs, you should read the book of Proverbs. A person's discretion makes him slow to anger. And it it is his glory to overlook an offense. A person's discretion makes him slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. His discretion makes him slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. I have a confession. Are you ready for a confession? Is this being recorded so my wife can play it for me later? Um, I have a confession. I get so offended so easily. And some of you are thinking, well, Ken, I've never seen it. Well, it's just because I've learned how to hide it from you. But you know who can offend me and make me the most angry? The woman that I am betrothed to and love dearly to the bottom of my heart. My wife can offend me and she don't even know she's offended me. And then she gets mad. Do you see a pattern? She gets mad because I got mad. Now I'm mad that she's mad. That doesn't happen to anybody else's house, I'm sure. I struggle with, with being judgmentally and I'm bitter and live in perpetual offense from being, can I say it, I get constantly ticked off by small things. I get constantly upset, frustrated, and angry about small things. I also get upset about the large things. But um, matter of fact, I was walking through the living room Thursday night, and Winnie said, "Mm, you look like a grumpy old man. And I said, I am. Just like the I am. It's, it's almost like, um, do y'all remember the documentary, um, The Avengers, when um, Captain America said to Bruce Banner, Dr. Banner, it'd be a good time for you to get angry right now. And he turns back and says, that's my secret, Captain. I'm always angry. That's me. I'm always frustrated. I'm always upset. I'm always the Hulk just waiting to bubble out. I'm, I'm, I'm confessing to y'all. I'm telling y'all the truth and shaming the devil this morning. If you're thinking, I don't want to see Ken but turn green and bust out of his clothes, I don't either. But... <laughs> I struggle with offense and anger on a regular basis all the time. And sometimes it's small things, and sometimes it's big things, but it's all the time. And if I struggle with it, I got a funny feeling. Anybody ever had a funny feeling? That you do too. I got a funny feeling you do too. You struggle with it too. But I am learning the hard way. See, there's some things I learned the easy way. It only took me one time growing up to touch the, hot, the, the, to touch the wood heater to find out that I don't want to touch that thing again. So some things I learn quickly. Some things I learn quickly. But some things, I only, I'm only, I'm only going to get one ticket the rest of my life, and I've already gotten it. I got my ticket, and it was in a, what's the, what's the county that a Goldsboro's in? Is that Wayne? I had to go there. I had to jump through hoops to get in the courthouse. Honey, if whatever lesson they were teaching me, I learned it. I'm not going back to the courthouse. They had to catch me, but I ain't getting another ticket, right? But there's some things I, I, I have to learn the hard way. And I'm learning the hard way that staying offended. Listen to me now. I'm learning the hard way that staying offended and staying ticked off never, ever, 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 ever helps me. And it doesn't help you either. 
Staying ticked off and offended and upset about a situation never, ever, only ever, never helps you. Once again, I'm not saying you don't have a right to be upset. I'm not saying you don't have a right to be ticked off. I'm not even saying I have to understand it. But continuously living in offense is never going to help you physically or spiritually. Living with the grudge. I have never found myself saying that my day is better and my marriage is stronger and my relationships are more mature because I'm carrying a grudge about something concerning somebody else. I am constantly reminding myself that I'm not old, but I'm older than I've ever been. And if statistics prove true and family history, I might have another 45 years left on this ball of rock. And I'm constantly reminding myself, listen, that, that just because you're not a pastor doesn't mean this isn't relevant to you. Please hear what I'm saying. I am constantly reminding myself my life is too short and God's calling on my ministry for me is too great for me to stay offended, upset, and hold a grudge. And I don't care if you're 18 or 88, your life is too short, God's calling on your life is too strong to stay offended, upset, and hold a grudge. Because did you know there's no one else like you? You've heard this since you were a little child, but I want to reemphasize it to you. You're on this planet. Your parents might not have planned for you to be here, but you are not here by accident. And there's no one else like you. No one else has your fingerprint. No one else has your DNA. No one else has your retina scan information. There's only one of you. So basically, when God made you, he looked at himself and said, I'm never going to do that again. But he made you, and you are unique, and you're not here. You are here for a purpose and a reason, and your life is way too important to live holding an offense, being upset, and a grudge. Because as a, a grudge, especially as a Christian, will cause you to be offended, sidetracked, distracted, hurt, and hurt others, and lead you to unforgiveness, which I, again, will repeat, unforgiveness will lead you to hell as a professing Christian. So, so let, me, let me camp there just a second. Holding a grudge will keep will make you offended and sidetracked. Anybody else get sidetracked? Anybody else have? And I'm not making light of it, but the doctor, this is going to be a huge surprise to some of you, the doctor gave me ADD medication recently. I know that's a huge shock to some of you, but I get sidetracked so easily. I get, and, and, and some of you are thinking, I know that's why you're always on that phone. No, it's, it's not just the phone. It's I can start doing something in the house, and I'm like, good gracious, that, that, that part of the floor kind of needs to be wiped up, kind of needs to be not mopped. I ain't going to mop, but... Um, <laughs> like an old rag and some soapy water. So I'll stop what I'm doing, and I'll go get something. And, I, and then, of course, once I clean that area, I realize, well, good gracious, the rest of it kind of needs to be. So then I'm spraying, and I'm doing this, right, with the rag. And it would have just been easier if I'd have just stopped and mopped, right? If I'd have just swept and mopped, I'd have been done. But then, of course, after I do that, then I got to, well, now i got this dirty rag, uh, I don't want this rag smelling sour. I need to start the washing machine. So I go to the washing machine, and there's clothes already in the washing machine. Shucks. Um, okay, so let me take the stuff out of the dryer. The stuff in the dryer is damp. All right, let's start. Let's check the lint. Is anybody picking up what I'm putting down? Does anybody else get distracted other than me like that? You understand what I'm saying? And then you finally, like an hour and a half later, come back to where you were. And you were like, why? This is not important anymore. This is, <laughs> this is not important. Offense will sidetrack you. Offense will sidetrack you just like, just like uh, uh, other things in life will sidetrack you. Offense will sidetrack you. You have to be careful. Offense will distract you. Offense will distract you. And holding on to offense will not only hurt you, but it will hurt others. There, there's a couple things I tell myself constantly. I've actually had to, I actually had to, in love, tell my dad this a couple times. Um, number one, in life, you cannot expect you out of other people. Did you hear what I said? You can't expect you out of other people. 
And even if you show up every time and you return their calls and you take a casserole over when someone passes away and you're checking on people, don't expect everyone to do the same thing for you. Quit expecting you out of other people. Quit expecting you out of other people. I can't believe they didn't call as many times I called them. Quit expecting you out of other people. And the second one I've had a hard time learning. I know it here, but I'm having a hard time here. Is hurt people hurt people. Did you hear what I said? Hurting people hurt other people. Well, I just condense it down to hurt people hurt people. Because most of us, now I mean, unless you have a, unless you're a sociopath or a psychopath, you don't enjoy hurting other people. But most of us do not enjoy hurting other people. But when we are hurt, we don't care. We don't care if we burn the house down. I'm hurting them because they hurt me. Y'all are not listening. Y'all aren't paying attention to me. That's a grudge that's going to lead you to hell. Hurt people hurt people. Quit expecting what you would do out of other people. So quit expecting you out of other people and hurt people hurt people. If you don't get anything outside of it today, those things are going to lead you to a grudge and hurt people hurt people and your life is too short and your calling is too strong for you to hold on to an offense and get distracted and get thrown off your mission. Some of you remember about 30 years ago, I can't remember the flight number, but a flight left... I think it was California, and they were off one degree. But after they flew thousands of miles, they found themselves in hostile airspace, and it was a civilian, it was a civilian plane, and it was shot down. Does anybody remember this story? That was a big, fat, hairy deal. But when they left California, they were only off one degree. But over the course of a 1,000 miles... The small things started to add up, didn't they? The exact stinking same thing in your life. So it's the times that you don't feel like coming to church that's the most important for you to come. Because those small, those small beginnings of, I'm just going to miss because I don't feel like it. You don't miss work because you feel like it. You don't miss hunting because you don't feel like it. You don't miss going to the ball game because you don't feel like it. You may keep going. You don't miss going out to eat because you don't feel like it. You're going to eat, ain't you? Yeah. And you might not remember what you had for supper last Thursday, but it sustained you, didn't it? Same thing with your spiritual life. What are you doing? What are the small things that are adding up to make a difference? Because a grudge, especially as a Christian, will cause you to hold on to unforgiveness and lead you to hell. Matthew 6, let me reiterate it again, just in case y'all think I'm making this up. For if you forgive other people their offenses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive other people, then your Father will not forgive your offenses. Um, I was talking to Robin earlier today, and you can ask her the details of it. But she says sometimes forgiveness is like kissing the porcupine. (laughs) Sometimes you have to kiss the porcupine. Um, and then uh, f- further on, over in Proverbs 19, it uses a beautiful phrase that, that, that I, I spoke about, and, and we're going to camp here for just a few seconds, a few moments. A person's discretion makes him slow to anger, and it is his glory to, everybody say it with me, overlook, overlook an offense. Overlook. Let's camp there a minute. Overlook an offense. When was the last time you overlooked something somebody did to you? I don't mean accepting abuse. I'm talking about overlooking an offense. Because as I mentioned earlier, unless someone has a severe mental condition of psychopathy or or they're, um, they're mentally ill, most people don't go about their days looking for how to offend or hurt someone's feelings. Most of us are what my uncle would say. Most of us are ignorant to the fact that we're dumb. Most of us are ignorant to the fact that we're dumb. And the Bible says we're supposed to overlook an offense. Now, let me reiterate. I'm not making light or belittling saying you don't have the right to be offended. I'm just telling you as your pastor what the Bible says that Christians are supposed to do with even the smallest offense in your life. We're supposed to overlook, give others the benefit of the doubt, and forgive everyone. You don't have to like it, but you do. I love the story told by Pastor Josh Hanna. Josh Hanna. Um, pastors, uh, I'm trying to give you the abbreviated version of the story. 
anyway, he pastors a, a, he started a church and then they started planting churches in, in a rural, rural Tennessee where they str- lots of people struggle with substance abuse and, and methamphetamine addiction. And it got to the point that they opened um, a, a, um, a rehab center, a Hope Center, Hope Center is what it's called. And it, they started having vans. They were transporting people. He said, and one day he's just driving along, and he passes a Hope Center ministry van on the side of the road with half of the van sticking out in the road and half stuck kind of like in a, y'all know what the ditches are like in Tennessee, right, in, in especially rural areas. It's, it's not a lot of ditch to it. He said, and as he passed by, he notices this white smoke coming from the tires because there's one of the dudes from Hope Center on the back of the van jumping up and down on the bumper. And every time the tire makes contact, he goes, Whoa! and smoke bellows out from the back. So there's this, their church van with these guys blocking traffic both ways because people are waiting to get around. And, and there's white smoke. <laughs> he said, so I pull over. There's a little restaurant right kind of catty corner. He said, I pull over, and, and I, I walk over, and, 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 and we get the van. We get the van out, thankfully. He said, and we, we, we get off on the side of the road. He said, and, and, and I, don't, I don't handle Hope Center ministry stuff anymore. He said, I have someone in our church that handles that. He said, but um, I go up to the van. As I'm going to this van, this guy runs out from the restaurant to the van. And he says, um, what's going on? And says, the man looks at him and says, well, it's, it's not your business. And Pastor Josh says, now I know I'm saved and I'm a pastor, but this dude obviously don't know who I am. He says, no, no, really, I want to know what's going on. And the dude said, sir, this is none of your blanking business. This is not your business. And Josh says, okay, all right. He looks around, and everybody's just staring at this guy who's speaking for everyone, and he says, listen, I, I, I don't know if you know, but you know, I'm the pastor of, of, of Hope Center Ministries and, and the church, and, and this is, and, and can you tell me what's going on? And he said, oh, oh, he said, this restaurant is my business, and when you kept asking what's going on, I just want to let you know this is my business, and I want your van out of here. <laughs> but the whole time he thought he was talking to one of the guys from Hope Center Ministries, he had to overlook. So every have you ever known, have you ever been in the, that you know something and then you find out you didn't know anything? Am I the only one that you know that you know? How many of you are brave enough? How many of you are brave enough in the middle of something that you know you're right to realize you misunderstand and go, wait a minute, I was wrong, and overlook an offense to you. Because a lot of times they didn't mean to offend you. Let's say it a different way. Most times people don't go about seeking a way to upset you and offend you. Why? Because the, the, the nature of humanity is we want people to like us. Most of us do. Some of us don't care. But most people want people to like them, right? And we know part of people liking us leads to civility. And the cornerstone of civilization is, finish the word for me, civility. So we want people to have at least a tolerance of us because we want other people to be civil to us. The Bible says a person's discretion makes him slow to anger and it is your glory to overlook an offense. Proverbs 12, excuse me, Proverbs 10 and 12. If you're not reading Proverbs, you should. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. Love covers all offenses. Hatred stirs up strife. You, when I was coming along, my, my mom and my grandma had a, stay, a saying about certain people. Oh, they just love to stir a mess up. They, said, they didn't say the word mess. Because I didn't grow up in church. They love to stir stuff up, and it won't the word stuff. When you're, when you, here's, here's a, here shall be a red flag to you. If you are stirring something up, it's probably not good. Unless it's a pot of chili on Wednesday night that you need to be coming to help cook. You see how I slid that right in there right there? Uh, If you're stirring something else up, you're probably not stirring up anything good. Right? Anybody ever stirred something up other than a a pot of chili that was good? Mm -mm, Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. What do you know if, what do you do if every interaction you have 
If you make a conscious or subconscious decision about your feelings concerning that interaction, there's always an action and an interpretation of the reaction. Most of you don't know this, but you make conscious and subconscious decisions about every interaction you have. I know every time I see Jeremy, I'm going to talk to him about a car. And I don't know why I am sometimes, but sometimes I know exactly why I am. Like, just in case y'all feel free to make fun of me, that's okay. We do that here, all right? My whole life, my whole life, I've been told when you put air in your tires of your car, you put about 80% of whatever the max PSI of the tire is. So if the tire says 44 PSI, you put around whatever 44 subtract 8 is, um, because that's 20%, that's how many PSI, that's where you start at for your tires. I was, I was uh, 45 years old when I learned, you put the exact amount of PSI it says on that sticker on the door frame. Did everybody else know that besides me? Okay, well, I didn't know that. I just want to let y'all know I learned that. And I asked Jeremy because I didn't know that. I, I, but, of course, now, when I was coming along, there weren't no stickers and no doors, right? You were lucky to have windows that worked, right? Um, <laughs> Or you're glad you had tires. I make a conscious and subconscious decision to every time I listen to Jeremy don't know everything. But if Jeremy starts talking about cars and tires and motors and engines, I I start listening. I start listening. Like like I was always told if you ever put, if you ever use synthetic oil, you can never go back to conventional. That's what the old people used to tell me. Now I'm finding out that most any oil you buy today is at least a blend of synthetic and conventional, if not completely synthetic. Blew my mind. Because for years, everything we had burned oil. (laughs) Anybody been there before? You had to check the oil. You didn't check the oil when it was time to change the oil. You checked the oil all the time because it was always burning and using oil. So I learned, I was 45 years old when I learned as long as it's oil, not, not, olive oil or vegetable, as long as it's motor oil, as long as, I'm just saying that for the record, I don't want anybody putting canola in there and saying, Ken, something happened to my engine, motor oil, non-edible oil, as long as you put oil in there, you're probably going to be okay unless you have a high performance engine of some kind, That's, but those are conscious and subconscious decisions I'm listening to, when it, when it concerns, when it concerns LP gas or or gas, it, it, concerning anything, the workings of heating and gas stuff. I know, I've seen Mr. Roger do stuff that I, with gas. I've seen, y'all don't tell nobody I told you this. I've seen Mr. Roger at a burn pile sitting out on a, on a sitting, sitting on something. I don't even know what sitting on. And he had an LP tank and he had a hose and he had a valve with a brass uh, tube on it. And he turns this on. And I'm watching him from my window thinking, well, I reckon it's a good day for me to die. And he, tu- he turns it on. <laughs> And he turns the valve on, and he holds the thing, and he goes, whoosh, whoosh, and it's, whoosh. so he's created a flamethrower because the burn pile is a little damp, but he's ready to get it over with. And he just sits there with a flame coming, and I'm thinking, this dude's got more guts than Dick Tracy. But, <laughs> but I've made a decision that he's obviously been around the barn long enough that he knows. One day, one day a few years ago, we walked out there, and you could tell there was some, some gas had liquefied and was seeping out of I don't even know what I'm talking about. The, the valve on the top of the tank need to be tightened up. And I'm standing around with the deacon saying, "Don't aren't you supposed to have like a aren't you supposed to have like a solid brass thing? Aren't there tools that you have to use so you don't create a spark or anything like that?" And in the meantime, I didn't know it. Mr. Rogers just sent somebody for a hammer, and he comes back and just goes, "Wham!" All right, there you go. Now, <laughs> uh, th- that's the basic gist of it. Well, <laughs> Mr. Roger knows what he's talking about when it comes to that gas stuff. I don't. I'm not doing that. If you'd have told me, if you'd have told me you could hook a hose up like that, and just, I was like, no, no, you can do it, but I ain't doing it. No, no, I'm not hitting that tank. However many thousands, of, how many gallons? No, no, I'm saying Spanish for you. No, I'm not doing it. But you are consciously and subconsciously picking up and making decisions about things that you're, every interaction you have with people. I know I'm never going to talk to Jimmy about quantum mechanics. Okay, but there's not a lot that, and I start naming names, I'll get in trouble, but there are some of you, I'm going to talk to you about certain things, and I'm not talking to you about certain things. I'll just smile and nod when you're talking to me about certain things, but some things you don't know what you're talking about. I just, 
just smiling. So if you ever, don't ever say, Ken, are you smiling and nodding because I don't know what I'm talking about? Don't ask me because you're going to be mad. <laughs> Love covers an offense. I'm so sorry I got distracted. I didn't mean to. Um, but we are consciously, that's where, that's where I got from. We are consciously and subconsciously making decisions about our feelings concerning the interactions we have with people. So if, if Tom tells me something, it's going to be different than someone who I've never met telling me something. You understand? If someone has proven themselves to be trustworthy, you put more stock into what they say than someone who hasn't, right? Like every one of us has knows someone that's going to pay us Friday. Don't you? If you don't know what I'm talking about, let me borrow $20 and I'll show you what it means. You let me borrow 20 and I say I'm going to pay you Friday. Well, I'm going to go ahead and tell you for the sake of the illustration, it ain't going to be this Friday. And it ain't going to be next Friday neither. You ain't never going to see that money again. <laughs> but the person who has paid us back, how many of you have ever been surprised that someone actually paid you back before? They're, they're going to get money again, aren't they? If they need money, they'll get money again. Because they've proven themselves. We are consciously making those decisions. You have to constantly make the decision with the gap between your action and reaction to the problem is often where you have a breakdown in interpretation. We've all had someone get offended or blow up and angry after we said something or did something because they interpreted it a certain way and leave us thinking, why in the world would they think I meant that? I never meant it that way. Has anyone ever had taking what you said out of context and got offended and, and, and you, you, you have a choice to make with every interaction you have with someone. You have to make a conscious effort how you're going to deal with that. And let, let, Did you know the person that offends you the most is going to offend you the most? Just think about that. You know why? Partially because you go into the conversation knowing that they're going to say something offensive. Because you have already worked out subconsciously that person is dumb as a box of rocks when it comes to this situation. And they're, I shouldn't have said that. Um, um, what they say, I've already interpreted it, and I know what they say. And did you see the way they talked to me? Um, I saw the way they were talking to everybody. Be careful how you interpret things. We are strongly biased to prescribe our own behavior to our circumstances while attributing someone else's actions to their character. Oh, that is so good. We are strongly biased to prescribe our own behavior to our circumstances while attributing someone else's actions to their character. So it works out like this. Well, I only did it that one time because of this circumstance, but I'm not like that person who does it all the time. But when you start, are you ready? When you start comparing sins, that is a slippery slope. Has anyone ever slipped down on purpose? Most of the time, you don't slip down on purpose, do you? And most of the time when you slip down, it's not a simple slip fall. It's a dance. Anybody else dance when they fall? They start slipping. It's a, it's a, you understand what I mean? When I was in service, I went to, I got off the bus in Great Mistakes, Illinois, December 3rd, 1995, and I thought I liked snow. I was wrong. At least I had some occasional experience with it. Those poor boys that I was in service with for three months um, who were from South Texas and stuff, it was funny and sad because you were not allowed to laugh. And honey, the dancing and... You're supposed to be marching in formation, you know, and you're marching along, and all of a sudden, the man goes, <laughs> you know, kind of like Michael Jackson. He's getting ready to, ooh, he's getting ready to bust a move on you. We, I'm so sorry. I got distracted. We prescribe our own behaviors to our circumstances while attributing someone else's actions to their character. Be careful not to be so judgmental about someone else when if you were in the same situation, it could be you. So how does this work out? If I do something wrong or something disappoints or offends me, I have a good reason. So what this means is when I'm upset, I have a good reason. But when other people are upset, they don't have a good reason. They have just as much a good reason as you do. 
When I'm upset, I have a good reason. I, I don't get upset about everything. That's a lie. <laughs> Let me, I'm talking about myself. I don't, I've quit saying to myself, I don't get upset about everything. Or uh, Here's another one I quit saying. Am I, I'm not hard to please. That is, that's a lie too. I am hard to please. <laughs> when it comes to certain things, I'm hard to please. So Jake said most things. Uh, I need to see you after church. Um, <laughs> if someone does something to offend me, they're just not a good person. When it's, They're thinking the same thing about us. Whether you're a Christian or not, you have a spiritual enemy, the devil. He has many titles, but one of them is called the accuser of the brethren. What does accuser mean? Somebody help me now. Somebody who blames stuff on you. So, so, so the devil is constant, and I don't understand all how, all how this works. If you do, great. Let me know. I'll let you teach on it. But at some point, the enemy of your soul, whether it's a demon that's assigned to you or one of the, one of the powers of hell are constantly saying, look at what he's doing. Look how he did that. Look, look, look at the sin in his life. Look at what he's doing. Look at what he's doing. Look, 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 look. You ever been around somebody that you want to say, just hush, just hush. I want to get a number. Anybody been like that? Accuser, 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 accuser. He stands around accusing you. It says he accuses us day and night nonstop over all the stuff we've done. Whether it's true or not, he constantly accuses us of wrongdoing. But an accusation is not proof. That's where I'm going to stop. An accusation is not proof. An accusation is not proof. And ask anyone who knows anything about the law. An accusation is not proof. An accusation is not proof. And, and here's the illustration I like to give. Um, just in case y'all don't know, I love cutting up. And I love cutting up with my wife. And... I have this idea that when we go in a store, I never liked it, and I don't do it anymore, but we don't separate, okay? If she wants to go look at feminine foo-foo stuff, I'm, I'm just going to stand right there with my hands in my pockets. It don't bother me. But if she walks away from me or I walk away from her, way back before cell phones, it used to take us forever to find each other. Now, she didn't mind it because she didn't want to be around me, but I did because I wanted to be with my wife. So... So still my philosophy is if she, I'm going to follow her around. And occasionally when I'm in a store, I want to go look at something else. And I expect her to follow me. But she, we compromise and she goes and does what she wants to do. And I go look at what I want to look at. Every time she does that, the last time I'm thinking about we were at Staples. I'm talking about accusing. We come out of the end of the aisle about, right about the same time. But she comes out in front of the little, the little cash register. And there's a little boy standing there at the cash register. And I come out four or five aisles down. <laughs> And I go, oh, my, that woman's stealing, ma'am. You got to take that out of your pocketbook. You got to pay for that. You can't put that in your pocketbook like that. <laughs> Winnie, the little boy, whatever he's doing, he looks up at Winnie like this. <laughs> and Winnie doesn't even turn and look in my direction. She just looks at him and says, I hear her say, after 20 years, it's just not funny anymore. And then she turns and walks a different direction. She doesn't even walk towards me. <laughs> but gentlemen, if you want to liven up your marriage, yell at your wife and accuse her of stealing <laughs> in the store. And let me know how that goes for you. <laughs> y'all, I just want y'all to know. <laughs> Hope Dale just took a knife out of her pocket and flashed it at Cheryl. Um, <laughs> Maybe I'll preach on marriage. Um, <laughs> but an accusation, I'll give you the illustration to tie it into what I said. An accusation is not proof. An accusation is not proof. An accusation is not proof. And the enemy of your soul may accuse you of something, but you are not necessarily guilty of it. When we get back together next time, we're going to continue talking about how grudges affect us and can cause us to be professing Christians and still go to hell. Did you hear what I said? Can you imagine? Can you imagine, Jake? Can you imagine? I'm, I'm going to stop with this sentence. And then I promise we're going to stand up, okay? Can you imagine praying the prayers, 
worshiping your God with your, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, paying your tithes, teaching Sunday school, helping at church, showing up early, staying late, doing the Christian, living the Christian life, and not hearing the Holy Spirit say to you, you need to forgive someone because you're holding offense against them and wake up and wake up on judgment day and find out you're going to hell because you held an offense in your heart. I bet it happens all the time. And it's part of my responsibility to let you know that you don't have to, they don't deserve it. They do not deserve it. You hear me, April? They don't deserve it, honey. They don't deserve it. Miss Alona, they don't deserve it. People that's offended you and hurt you, they don't deserve it, Jennifer. They don't deserve it. But you know what I don't deserve? I don't deserve the unmerited favor and forgiveness of God when I ask in sincerity and repent. I don't deserve it. What are you going to do with the gift you've been given to not walk around with offense? Small things that are adding up and spoiling the vine in your life. Bow your head with me, Father, in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to repent of the sins in our life. And help us, Lord, to forgive those who sin against us as we sin against others. Lord, I don't want to miss eternity with you. And Lord, if there's someone here who doesn't know you and they'd like to come forward to accept Christ before we leave, I'd love to meet you at these altars. Is there anybody here? Then Lord, I thank you, God, for helping us, for showing us, for keeping us, and for bringing us back the next appointed time. Lord, we'll be careful to give you the glory and the praise and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Tell somebody I'll see you Wednesday night at 6.30. You're dismissed. Jake, Winnie wants you outside.